Thank you all for coming to this presentation. The work that I'm presenting here today is about the state of iron at pressures relevant to the cores of super-Earth planets. This is a study based on first principle calculations from hundreds to thousands of gigapascals in pressure uh, from which we have derived entropies and the melting curve of iron and generated an equation of state that spans a huge range of pressures and temperatures. We recently published this equation of state in physical review research uh, where we report the densities, pressures, temperatures, and free energies that I encourage you to download. You can also go to my website with this QR code uh, where you can have a more manageable format for the equation of state tables. And our study is motivated by the apparent discrepancy in the melting temperature of iron at the pressure that is relevant to the inner core boundary of the Earth at 330 gigapascals. As you can see, there are many experiments that pinpoint to different melting temperatures at the same pressure, but there's a lot of scatter among the predictions of different uh, simulations as well. As you can see, some of them have been produced using the BCC phase of iron, which is not the phase that is most commonly considered uh, as the most stable phase of iron, which we believe to be HCP. But different phases will have different melting temperatures in principle, so it's really hard to understand the discrepancy in the literature. There is a recent experiment published last year uh, that was able to constrain the melting curve of iron up to 1,000 gigapascals in a shock ramp compression experiment. Uh, in this study, Krauss et al. basically shocked uh, solid iron to make it liquid, and then the decompressed liquid iron was ramp compressed until it hit the melting curve, and they observed in situ crystallization of HCP iron in the range of 300 to 1000 gigapascals. So the melting temperature of iron was constrained at 330 GPA to be 6200 Kelvin that we took to get the melting curve of iron was to obtain its free energies. So at different pressures and temperatures, we calculate the Gibbs free energies of solid and liquid iron. And when those free energies are equal, that defines a melting point. In order to obtain those Gibbs free energies, we use the thermodynamic integration technique, which is a technique that allows us to connect two systems through a smoothly varying parameter lambda that allows us to connect the free energies of both systems through these expressions. And if we know the free energy of the system that we start with, we can derive the free energy of the system at which we arrive to. So uh, if we start from an ideal gas, for instance, with zero interactions and a given free energy, Helmholtz free energy, we can derive the free energies of a classical system, for example. And then when we have those free energies, we can derive the free energies of our quantum system. For liquid iron at a given thermodynamic condition, say 330 GPA and 6400 Kelvin, uh, we can use different reference systems like a completely repulsive potential known as WCA, the repulsive Lennard Jones potential, or we can fit our own uh, classical potential to the DFT forces. And as you can see in this plot, what the difference will be that here the dependence on lambda is much more linear and easier to manage, while here, since the repulsive potential is so different from the DFT forces, uh, that requires you to have a much better resolution with respect to lambda to perform the integration. But nevertheless, when you do the integration and derive the Gibbs free energies at that specific pressure and temperature, the answer does not depend on the reference system used, and in this case it differs uh, just 2 milli electron volts per atom from each other, which is much smaller than the error bars. So you can see though that the error bars uh, in the different implementations are 10 times larger in the repulsive Leonard Jones potentials compared to our own uh, fitted potential. Now we'll repeat the same procedure at different temperatures. We do it for the solid, we do it for the liquid, calculate the differences here, uh, the plot on top, and we look for the intersection with zero where the liquid and the solid will have the same free energy. So over here, you can see that the transition occurs at 300 GPA at 6,500 Kelvin, which is our prediction uh, for the melting temperature of iron at this pressure. 
And as you can see here, both methods that I mentioned earlier for the liquid uh, provide exactly the same uh, Gibbs free energy within the error bars. Uh, but the repulsive Leonard Jones potential generates much larger error bars. And then we repeat the same procedure for other pressures. As you can see here, we have from 0.3 terapascals to 5 terapascals, which is 5,000 gigapascals. And the dependence of delta G with temperature is pretty linear. And the intersection here with 0 gives us the melting points for each of those pressures. Where melting temperatures derived this way are plotted here as a function of pressure in this diagram as the blue marbles. And you can notice that they are in remarkable agreement with experiments of Rick Krauss et al. that I mentioned to you earlier, where they shock and ramp compressed iron up to 1000 gigapascals. You can also observe that they are much higher than the temperatures predicted by the Lindemann law. And I, our melting curve is shallower than what was predicted earlier by Lars Tixrud in 2014. In order to understand the crystallization of the core of super Earths, we have to understand the relationship between the adiabats of liquid iron and its melting curve at megabar conditions. So if the adiabat is shallower than the melting curve, that means that as the planet cools down, the intersection will take place at the highest pressures first, and that is what defines bottom-up crystallization. So that is what we derive from our entropies that we get from our equation of state, which is what you can see here in this diagram, where the adiabats are always shallower than the melting lines using the reported uh, values of the entropy that we obtain from our thermodynamic integration calculations. So that supports the hypothesis of a bottom-up crystallization for super-Earth planets. We also built models for planetary interiors to understand the ranges of temperatures at which a super-Earth core can crystallize. And we compared two previously reported models, for example, by Papuk and Davis, that indicate that a five-Earth masses uh, super-Earth may start at 5,000 Kelvin in the core and the temperature would drop down in giga years time spans to 4,300 Kelvin. So we built such models uh, using uh, an iron core and a silicate mantle and using the core mass fraction uh, for the Earth, we build models that indicate that the crystallization of a five Earth masses exoplanet already starts when the temperature is 12,000 Kelvin, 12,500. And the crystallization is over, meaning that the complete core is frozen if the temperature drops below 10,600 Kelvin. So according to the previously reported models, this means that all super-Earths would have frozen cores because the temperatures in those models are just too low to support a liquid iron core. In addition to our first principle calculations, we also ran machine learning simulations that were trained on 144 atoms simulation cells and you were used to uh, run much larger simulations of uh, 1,300 uh, atoms and for a much longer time scale just to check that the energies and pressures and all those quantities were relatively well converged to reproduce uh, the energies and pressures that we would obtain with larger systems. So everything indicated that we were already converged with the parameters that we used at DFT and also when we use constant pressure simulations, the simulations seem to be stable uh, respect, with respect to system size deformation. So we have successfully derived a melting curve for pure iron that spans from 300 gigapascals to 5,000 gigapascals. And our calculations indicates that super earths crystallize from the center and they may all have frozen cores because uh, the current models uh, have temperatures that are too low to maintain a liquid iron core. Our calculations have been also validated by our machine learning simulations that are able to simulate much larger sizes and much longer time scales. So thank you for your attention. We would be happy to take any questions. Thank you.